I certainly hope the preaching is better than the song leading. So uh, let's let's get into that. Thank you all so very much for being here with us. It is such a privilege to be able to gather together for those of like precious faith. I was thinking of it as Brother Jerry was uttering that prayer just a few moments ago as we were all in unison in mind, thinking of the same thing, praying along with him. Do you know how very blessed we are to be in a congregation to where the, the individuals leading prayers, they are fervent and they are thoughtful and they are mature, uh, knowledgeable prayers. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? We take that for granted sometimes. You know, we pray a lot. We pray while we're by ourselves and during our daily activities. But what a blessing it is to be in the assembly and to play and, and to pray together. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? To pray together, to be able to sing together, and to be able to study. It's, it's uh, truly a, a blessing. And I, and I really hope that we take a moment uh, sometimes and just think about what a blessing that is. This evening, the book of Hebrews, we're continuing our study. We're going to, chapter, we're going to finish out chapter 8. Um, tonight, as we have learned, we're going to go through a quick review. And as we do, we're going to touch on some high points. And then we'll get into the text itself in chapter 8. And we will close it out. And then, of course, we will go into chapter 9 as we, uh, as we continue next week. Uh, you know, what's interesting, as we're going to see, uh, as we've seen already in the text in chapter 8, and as we're going to see in chapter 9, we're going to start, uh, we said chapter 7 was a change of a priesthood, and chapter 8 was a change of a covenant, and in chapter 9, we're really going to see, begin to see the changing of, of, a, of a tabernacle, if you will, as it is going to be spoken of. We're going to see the, the earthly tabernacle in the first three verses. And then we're going to, to get further into that chapter. I don't want to give any of that away, but I will give you a little heads up. Start reading ahead. Read ahead and, and, and see what you come up with. And then let's uh, present the lesson next week and let's see uh, how we all did as far as that goes. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews was an inspired document. We studied this morning in Bible study, 2 Peter 1 and verse 20. Peter would say that they were men as they spake in the old times, just as in the first century, men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. That's what it means. It is from God. It is the inspired Word of God. And the book of Hebrews is an inspired epistle written to Christians in the first century who were of a Jewish background, and they were in danger of going back into Judaism. Chapter 1, he establishes a point, and he does so immediately. And that point is Christ is superior. We'll say it three times. Christ is superior. He's superior to prophets, verses 1 and 2. Christ is superior. He's superior to angels, verses 3 through 9 and 13 and 14. And Christ is superior. He's superior to his own creation. <clears throat> verse 4 is very interesting as we get into chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 4. For he hath by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, speaking of the angels. This is important because chapter 2 is going to describe that Jesus is superior, therefore you must listen to him. And chapter 2 is going to tell you why he's superior. But it should be referenced and understood in light of chapter 1 verse 4. Jesus is not an angel. He's superior to angels because he has by, by an inheritance of pain and works of man. For to which of the angels saith he at any time, thou art my son this day, have I forgotten thee? Chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs, wonders, and divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So Jesus spoke this truth, Jesus spoke salvation, and you better listen to Jesus. Why? Jesus is superior. Now, beginning in verse 5, we start to have the explanation as to why you must listen to Jesus. And again, I, as I referenced, that goes right back to chapter 1 and verse 4. He has, by an inheritance, obtained a more excellent name. Let me ask you something rhetorically. Don't answer me. But I, I ask these questions sometimes, don't I, just to get us thinking. In what way was Christ superior to angels? Well, you see, Eric, Christ is deity. And deity is always superior to everything. Well, yeah, you're right. But in the book of Hebrews, it isn't his deity that makes him superior. By an inheritance. It's interesting. Let me give you something similar to think about. In Hebrews, or excuse me, in Philippians chapter 2. It says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus our Lord, who existing in the form of God, can not being on equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as man, he opened himself, becoming obedient, even at the death, yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore also God highly exalted him, and gave unto him the name which is above every Name, verses 5 through 
9 and 10. Jesus is superior by inheritance because of his role as human being in the lineage of Abraham. He was a human being. He came, he lived, and he died, and he is now able to redeem man. That's why he's superior, and that's how it's by inheritance. So we understand that, that Jesus is superior, certainly, because he's deity, but he's superior in another way, and that's what's being emphasized here. And now beginning in verse 5 of chapter 2, let's tie this in. For not unto the angels... For not unto the angels, there's a contract. Hath he put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak? But one testified in a certain place, saying, Who is man? Who is man that thou art mindful of him? David said that. Fast forward to verse 9. But now we see Jesus, who is a man little lower than the angels, for the suffering and death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Why should we listen to Jesus? Because he's superior, because of his role as redeemer. And his role as redeemer required him to be a human being, a man, made in the image of man, Philippians 2, made after the, the, uh, the, the lineage of Abraham, and this man would be redeemer because he would choose to do right. And as we talked about earlier, maybe it was uh, Wednesday night in John 17, verse 19, Jesus said, I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified through truth. Had he not sanctified himself, we couldn't be sanctified. And that's his role as redeemer. Chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as Moses also is faithful in all of his house. For this man is counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as the builder of the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but the builder of all things is God. Verse 5. For Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. There's one thing. Verse 6. But Christ as a son. There's another thing. So we have a contrast in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and that is Moses compared to Jesus. Moses was a mediator of his covenant. That's true. Moses acted as intercessor on behalf of the children of Israel. That's true. Moses was the lawgiver, quote unquote, uh, acting by the authority of God. That's true. But there's a, there's a huge difference. Moses was the leader, but he wasn't the redeemer. Jesus was the redeemer. Did Moses die sinlessly? To purge his folks, his, his people, from their sin? No, Jesus did. It's no contest, is it? Moses isn't even in the same ballpark, we'd say. Moses, he's a great man. He's not this great. This is something different. This is, uh, this is a name above every name, as we said in Philippians 2. Now, chapter 3 is going to tell you the consequence now of disobedience to Moses. Reference Hebrews 12, 25. If we refuse him that spoke from earth, how much more so... Of him that spoke from heaven. The consequence of disobeying Moses, we studied a little bit of that this morning in Numbers 14. They were destroyed by the Amalekites and the Canaanites. They were, uh, they were beaten by them when they presumed to go up without the authority of God, even though God had already said go, but then they did not, and then God wasn't going to be with them. So because of their rebellion, they would not see the land of Canaan. There was a consequence to an action given by the authority of God through Moses, and there's a consequence to an action given by the authority of God through his son. And this consequence, if this consequence was grave for disobeying Moses, how much more so is it grave for disobeying Christ? That's the point. Chapter 1, Jesus is superior. Chapter 2, he's superior because of his role as man, and you better listen to him. In chapter 3, he is better than Moses, and look at the consequence for disobeying Moses. Chapter 4. It's interesting that chapter 3 ends where they look back at the children of Israel and their rebellion and their falling from grace, so to speak, and in two times in those last three verses, it mentions the word unbelief. The American Standard sometimes translates that as disobedience. In John 3.36, uh, it is disobedience. That is the word the American Standard translates. But the King James says unbelief. The, the right word is to disobey. That's what it means here. These individuals could not enter the land of Canaan because they disobeyed God. Now chapter 4 beginning in verse 1 says, let us therefore fear. Isn't that interesting? Chapter 3 Paints a picture of the consequences of rebellion to God. In chapter 4, he begins with this warning. Let us fear. Interesting. Let us fear lest we fail to obtain this promise, is what he says in the first couple of verses. Now he goes on to explain that the promise of this rest isn't realized under the law of Moses. The Sabbath wasn't the fulfillment of it. The Sabbath was a shadow. In Colossians 2, beginning in verse number 15, it speaks of Christ who made a show of these principalities and powers and triumphed over them openly. 
Then he would go on to say, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which were a shadow of things to come. Which, which Sabbath was a shadow? All of them. The weekly Sabbath. The seven-year Sabbath. The Jubilee. Forty-nine years. They were all foreshadows of something greater. And they were not the actual fulfillment. Something cannot necessarily be uh, the shadow of and also the fulfillment of. This is something greater. And this rest is going to come from their sins and specifically to this nation from the law of Moses. And it will be found only in Christ, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And of course, ultimately, rest is going to be for us, Revelation 14, 13 in heaven. The end of chapter 14 speaks about a high priest that we have that was tempted in all manner like as we are yet without sin. Now in chapter 5 it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in the things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant them that are out of the way? I think that's interesting. The high priest is a man that ought to be compassionate towards his fellow man. What was Jesus' compassionate? Let's go back to chapter 4, four for just a second, the last part of that. For we have not such a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all manners tempted like as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly into the throne of grace. We can, can't we? He faced every trial and temptation that human beings take face. When we go through things, we think that we're the only ones. No, we're not. Jesus faced the same trials and temptations, so to speak, that man faces, and he came through them triumphantly. Therefore, he knows what difficulty it can be to face these, and he can be merciful to us. The end of chapter 5 is an admonition that they ought to be a little stronger, shouldn't they? You should be a little stronger, and we can talk more about them, Chelsea. Chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. We ought, to, we ought to grow, right? We ask this question a lot. Are we growing? If we're not growing here, there's no excuse for it. We're teaching a lot of Bible. Why are we growing? Well, it takes a little more effort. Anybody just eat on Wednesdays and, and Sundays? Not me. As if you couldn't tell. Not me. Well, why is it that you only eat spiritually on Wednesday and Sunday? You don't want to open the Bible yourself during the week? How do you think you're going to grow? Is As we grow, we learn. And as we grow and learn and develop, we learn to trust more in God. And that basically sums up chapter 6. Chapter 7. A changed priesthood. For this was Jezebel, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave the tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and also after that king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided the priest continually. Here is a foreshadow of Christ. Melchizedek wasn't deity, Melchizedek wasn't Jesus, Melchizedek was simply a foreshadow of Jesus. He was a king and a priest at the same time, and it was apart from the lineage of Levi, apart from the lineage of Abraham. And that, or that, that specifically dealing with Abraham's lineage as it pertains to the law of Moses. He was separate and distinct, and that is the priesthood that foreshadowed Christ. Chapter 7 and verse number 11, perfection is not by the Levitical priesthood, is it? Very next verse in chapter 12, for the priesthood being changed or is made of necessity, change also in the law. Now we're going to go back to that tonight for just a moment as we get into the end of this. Because what we have here in chapter, 12 and 13, or chapter 8, verses 12 and 13 is the finishing up of the quote of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And we need to understand the time frame reference there because this can confuse people. So we're going to go back here and make a point. So just remember that. Chapter 8. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. He's summing up what we've talked about so far. We have such a high priest. Is that present tense? Yeah, it is. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the majesty of the throne in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, to the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he could not be priest, seeing that there on earth priests offer gifts according to the law, which are a shadow or serve under the shadow of heavenly things, or example of the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, as he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou maketh all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, established upon better promises. For if the curse of the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finally fought with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Remember that, Deuteronomy 5. 
that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That gives you wind. And they continue not in my covenant, saith the Lord. Or they continue not, and I regarded them not. They continue not in my covenant, so I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So you have all of these things leading up to chapter 8 and the, the total changing of the covenant. But this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I'll be to them a God and I'll be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his brother and every man, or every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. And that which decayeth and waxeth away is nigh to vanishing away. Or by nigh to vanishing. So let's look now at verse number 12. Those that know the Lord are those to whom the Lord will be merciful. Now we talked about previously who are these being spoken of. When he says they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord. Why does he say that? Remember last week we told you why. You remember what I was saying last week? Under the old law you were born first and taught second. Under the new law you're taught first and born second. Right? That's the way it goes. In that way, everybody that's already in this new covenant, how, they already knew the Lord. They already knew Him. You didn't have to teach them because they already knew Now, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't continue to be taught, but it's saying, it's, it's speaking of knowledge of Him. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you have those children who were born into this nation. They were born into this nation, and once they got old enough, what happened? They were taught. But in order to be born in the new covenant, you've got to be taught first. Then you obey that gospel. Then you're born spiritually. So those that know the Lord are those to whom the Lord will be merciful. In 1 John 2, beginning in verse 3, it says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, how can we know if we know God? Does it have anything to do with the t-shirt? Have anything to do with the bumper sticker? Share this on Facebook if you love the Lord. No, it has nothing to do with it. This is how. This is how. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What happens, inspired Apostle John, what happens if we say we know the Lord, but we don't keep his commandments and you're liar? How's that? It's pretty easy. Straightforward. Simple. I like simple. I'm not that smart, so simple makes it easy for me. Smart. Oh, let's, let's think simply. This is so because they meet the Lord's terms for pardon. In Acts chapter 2, they met the Lord's terms for for pardon. So let's go back for a second. I will be merciful to their iniquities. So those that know the Lord are those to whom the Lord is merciful. So let's look and see who the Lord is merciful to. In Acts 2 and verse 21, Peter quotes from the, uh, from the prophet Joel in Joel 2.32. And he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, is that speaking along the terms of being merciful? God being merciful to man? Shall be saved from what? You know, in Luke... Uh, in Luke chapter 7, in verses 48 and 50, the Lord is there in, in Simon's house, and that woman is there, and Simon is a Pharisee, and he hasn't offered him anything for his, uh, for his feet, to wash his feet. And this woman is there, and she is bathing his feet in tears and wiping them with the hair of her head. And in verses 48 and 50, I think this is interesting, because he uses certain terminology that we can learn from. He asked Simon a question about who would love more, to whom is forgiven more, or for whom is, is forgiven less? And he would say more. And he says, this woman, her sins be great, but they're forgiven. And then in verse 50, he says, thy faith has saved thee. I think that's interesting. You know why? Because we're saved from something. What is it? In Acts chapter 2, when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were asking, what shall we do to be rid of this condemnation for killing the Savior? What shall we do about our sins? They weren't asking some off-the-wall question. If you're saved, you're saved from your sins, not from something else, right? That's understood. So here we go. Acts 2 and verse 21, calling upon the name of the Lord is how men would be saved. Well, is that being merciful to certain people? Yeah, it is. Isn't it? Now, how are they? How did they call upon the name of the Lord? Well, let's keep looking at this. In Acts 22, 16, Paul recalls his conversion. And he is speaking of Ananias. And Ananias would say to Paul, and now, while tarriest thou, rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's interesting. In Colossians 2, beginning in verse number 10, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and powers, and whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, 
and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him to the faith of the operation of God who had raised him from the dead. And you, being in sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him. That means made alive, doesn't it? Quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So let's go back for just a moment to verse number 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Eric, what does Colossians 2, 10 through 13 have to do with Acts 2, 21 and Acts 22, 16? Well, that's a good question. And the, the answer is, when we call upon the name of the Lord, we're looking to the Lord to save us by doing what the Lord said to do. So when you trust in God to be baptized for the mission of your sins, baptized into Christ, buried with Christ, you're trusting the faith of the operation of God. Your faith is in Him to save you. You're doing what He told you to do, therefore you're calling on Him, you're invoking His authority to save you through obedience to His will. Who is God merciful to? The obedient. Revelation 1. And from Christ Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and he hath made us kings and priests unto God the Father. The American Standard says that he hath made us a kingdom of priests. Reference 1 Peter 2 9. Reference Exodus 19 and verse 5. Who are priests to God? Christians. How are we Christians? We are washed from our sins in his blood. Now, is that being merciful to certain people? Yes, it is. He will be merciful to their unrighteousness. This is through the gospel. There's only one way to save man from sin. You remember when we did the book of Romans, uh, when we went through that, we, we discussed this in a similar way that we do to Hebrews. We'd go through and review every time, and almost every time exclusively, we would quote Romans 1, 16, 17. God's power to save man is the gospel, period, in the story. There is no other way. Well, I was saved when I said a prayer. No, you weren't. How do you know? Because prayer is part of the gospel. I was saved whenever I accepted Jesus in my heart. No, you weren't. How do you know? Well, that has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel says nothing about accepting Jesus in your heart. The only way in which you accept Jesus in Colossians chapter 2 is that you are putting on him in baptism. That's the only way in which there is any acceptance. You accept his gospel and you submit to it in your obedience of faith. What else is there? The other stuff simply isn't biblical. Romans 3, beginning verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Where is redemption? Redemption is in Christ. Justified. What does that mean? Just as I've never sinned. Freely. Through the redemption that is found where now? In Christ. If you're justified, where are you? You're in Christ. Where redemption is. How do you get in Christ? Well, you've only one way to get in Christ. Romans 6, 3. Galatians 3, 26. That's baptism into Christ. This describes the obedient. Romans chapter 4. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know, there's a lot of folks who have a lot of weird ideas about this. You know, this is, this is simple. This is Romans 4, and it deals with, with Paul talking about uh, summing up these argumentations, and he uses David as an example. And David said, Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin to, and blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven. What's the difference in those two? No, nothing. The concept of having your sins not reckoned unto you is the same concept as being forgiven. Who is that? Well, in verse 12 it says, Those that walk in the steps of that faith of Abraham. That's pretty easy, isn't it? Why is this so hard? This isn't hard, is it? Do I look like a rocket scientist to you? No. This isn't difficult. This is easy. All we've got to do is do a little bit of study, a little bit of proper application, a little bit of reasoning, and we can reason this out. We don't have to make it difficult. But he said this. doesn't matter what he said. But the pastor said, no, doesn't matter what the pastor said. But this catechism said this. But they voted and said this. No, but the Baptist faith manual says this. No, it doesn't matter. But this commentary says this. No, it doesn't matter. It matters what this says. The Bible is what matters. And folks, commentaries aren't going to get you to heaven. The Bible is. So why don't we just put those down? We can use them to reference, right? But let's pick up this book and put your nose in it and do a little study. Because you can figure it out. It's not that hard. You can handle it right. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. We have to understand the Bible in such a way as that it is harmonious with itself. The Bible is truth, right? John 17, 17. It's settled in heaven, right? Psalm 119, 89. It can't be changed. It's eternal. We have to understand the Bible in such a way as it is harmonious with itself. So when, when, when 
Jeremiah was speaking prophetically about a time when God would be merciful to, to unrighteousness and he would forgive their sins. We have to understand that this is only done one way because the Bible, in its, in its sum of the biblical teaching, is there's only one way to be forgiven of sin, and that's through obedience to the gospel. Remember in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom you submit yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Verse 17, But thanks be to God that whereas you were, what's that word? Grammarians? Past tense. But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. What form of teaching did they hear? Let me, let me refresh your memory. This is Romans 6, 17. Turn it back five chapters. Romans 1, 16. That is the message that they heard, the gospel of Jesus Christ that makes them free from sin. That's the, and, and the result is what? Verse 17. Excuse me, verse 18. Having been then made free from sin, they became servants of righteousness. That's easy. You mean to tell me that all you have to do is go through and see what, what every reference to being forgiven, put them all together, and then draw a reasonable conclusion about it because that's actually what the Bible, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Oh, well, he was just saved by saying a prayer. Oh, well, I just know Romans 10.10 10 is all you have to do to be saved. No, it's not. Oh, I just know I can, I can look in the book of John and find everything I need to be saved. Oh, yeah, the word repent's not in the book of John. What about that? We have to look at all of it, don't we? And all of it works together in perfect harmony, and this is what we're talking about. This is God's mercy, the gospel. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him, Hebrews 5.9. When was God's mercy realized? It was spoken of prophetically in the old times. When was it actually a reality? When was it actually realized? When did the event happen that made it possible? And we're getting somewhere now. Notice the, the new covenant in the beginning of it. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Of course, that was added to the church. Verse number 47. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, remember we said this. We mentioned this, uh, we mentioned this earlier. If a sin is forgiven by God, it's forgotten by God. Okay? We can go back to the book of Psalms, and we can look at Psalm chapter 103, and we can see where he says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. If sin is forgiven, it's forgotten. When David was forgiven of his sin with Uriah and Bathsheba, when Nathan came to him, and Nathan said, The Lord hath put this away, it was done. But that's not what the reference is. The reference is to this. Sins were forgiven in the Old Testament, Psalm 85, 2, 2 Samuel 12, 13. Yet year by year there was a remembrance of man's separation. Every time the priest went in that veil, guess what they saw? A cherub. What was guarding the east side or the entrance to the garden of Eden. Cherry. Where was man at one point? He was in perfect, harmonious fellowship with God in the garden. Sin separated him from God. When they saw a cherry, they would think of separation. Every time that high priest walked in that holiest place, they saw separation. Every how often? Every year. Year by year by year, there was a remembrance of sin. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image or substance, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Well, I thought you said that sins were forgiven. I believe they were. If you want to think that sins were rolled over, that's your business. I think that God means what he says. I think God can 